Good morning, everyone. My name is Danielle Davis, and I'll be coordinating things on the back end. So if you have any questions um, during this event, feel free to place them in the Q&A box. Um, I'd like to welcome you to today's presentation where you will hear about the advancements in blood biomarker research and what that could mean for the future of Alzheimer's disease. Scott, next slide, please. Okay, so thanks again for coming. This event is being recorded and it will be available for your viewing um, later this week. And you can also share it with anyone that didn't have an opportunity to make it today. There will be an event evaluation that will be prompted right at the end of the session. If you could please take your time to fill out the evaluation, it's about seven questions. Um, if you don't have the time today, then there will be a link that will be sent to you. So if you could please fill out the evaluation, your feedback is important and appreciated. So thank you for that. All right, so for those of you that are new to the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, we are a center here in Ann Arbor um, that's a collaboration between the University of Michigan, Wayne State, and Michigan State University. We offer a variety of dementia-related research studies, and so if you're interested in learning more about our wellness programs for caregivers, Lewy Body Dementia Support Groups, or if you want to get involved with research, feel free to please visit our website our social media or reach out to me and I can point you in the right direction. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our facilitator, Dr. Scott Roberts. Dr. Roberts is a professor of health and behavior and health education at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. He also directs the Outreach Recruitment and Education Corps here at the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. So please join me in welcoming Scott Roberts. Dr. Roberts, take it away. Yeah, thanks so much, Danielle. It's great to be with everybody this morning. Uh, I know it's uh, strange sometimes to be in this bizarro Zoom world, but uh, one silver lining uh, for our speaker series has been that I think we've actually had increased attendance at these events, given that for some it's a lot easier to be able to log in via Zoom. So we're really excited to be with you today and hope you're hanging in there in these uh, stressful times. So um, I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by just briefly introducing our panelists and having them just say a little bit about you know, how their work relates to today's topic. Then I'll go into a brief, uh, just some background to kind of set the stage and make sure we're all on the same page. And then we will follow with uh, some discussion with the panelists and then finally end up with open Q&A uh, with the audience. So uh, to start with, let me introduce our first uh, distinguished panelist, uh, Dr. Nicholas Kanan. So Dr. Kanan um, has a PhD in neurosciences and he's associate professor in the Department of Transla Translational Neurosciences at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. So even though uh, Michigan State and Michigan will be enemies on the football field this weekend, they're in good harmony in this session. So um, Dr. Kanan, uh, can you just tell us a little bit more about your research and how it relates to today's topic? Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to, Scott. Um, thanks for the introduction, and I'm happy to be here with all of you uh, to share in the discussion. Uh, my expertise is uh, focused on Alzheimer's disease and other tauopathies, so I'm kind of usually one of the tau guys in the room, um, which is the protein that makes up tangles, um, for those of you that aren't, aren't sure. Um, and we, we do a lot of different uh, approaches to studying Alzheimer's disease and tauopathies, including animal models and some basic science research. But one of the expertise I've developed through my career is uh, making antibodies. And so we have a large um, toolkit of antibodies that are against various forms of tau that we think are important in the context of human disease. And we'll be applying those um, to try and develop novel biomarker assays. And so that's how we kind of fit into this. Um, also, as part of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, um, in, in our renewing application, we uh, have included a biomarker core, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that throughout the session. Um, and I'm co-leading that with my colleague here at Michigan State, uh, Dr. Dave Morgan. So um, we're excited about the work we'll do, and uh, I'm excited to talk to everyone today. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Kane, and I'm sure we'll being the towel guy will come in handy uh, during this session. 
So our other distinguished panelists, uh, many of you may know him, is uh, Dr. Hank Paulson, who is the Lucille Groff Professor of Neurology at the University of Michigan School of Medicine. He also, as uh, many of you may know, directs our Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, uh, NIH-funded grant that Danielle mentioned. And he also co-directs, uh, which I think is relevant for today, the Protein Folding Disease Initiative uh, here at U of M. And um, to top it all off, he was recently elected this week, I believe, to the National Academy of Medicine, a very uh, fine honor. So Dr. Paulson, uh, congratulations there. And uh, maybe you can say a little bit about both how your research and clinical work particularly relate to today's topic. Thank you, Scott. It's great to be here, and thank you all for participating in today's uh, Zoom webinar. Um, I am a neurologist. I see patients who have cognitive disorders and have more broadly neurodegenerative disorders. I had my clinic yesterday. I also am a neuroscientist, and I run a laboratory that really studies how proteins abnormally fold and aggregate. We already heard that Nick is a tau guy. Uh, I am a broader protein misfolding guy, if you will. And uh, while we do work on tau, we work on many other proteins as well. And that'll be a point that will come up here is that many different dementias and many different degenerative brain diseases have different proteins that accumulate. Tau is a, a critical one in Alzheimer's, but it also plays a role in several other important neurodegenerative diseases. I'm sure that'll be a point for discussion. Anyway, glad to be here today and also really delighted to have Dr. Kanan uh, directing the biomarker core as part of the ABRC. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Paulson. So uh, now I'm going to go into just some you know, brief background slides. I know we have probably wide uh, ranging levels of expertise out there in the audience. So I just want to make sure we're all you know, on the general same page here. And hopefully it'll provide some context for the discussion that follows. So many of you probably know about this idea of an Alzheimer's disease continuum. And you can see here from this figure uh, how it talks about progression over time from having you know, no symptoms at all all the way into severe Alzheimer's disease. And so what's been really important um, in the research world has been trying to have a greater understanding kind of more on this left side. So in the past, we've often been able to only know about Alzheimer's disease even after death, you know, due to autopsy of the brain. But in the research world, we've been able to develop some methods for identifying what's going on in the brain even before any kind of cognitive symptoms occur. So I think that's really where uh, a lot of the effort has been because I think it can be valuable in, in two ways. One, it's just helpful ultimately, ideally, in being able to more accurately detect the disease earlier so we can intervene earlier. And uh, I think that helps uh, improve the accuracy potentially of diagnostics. But then also I think this idea that most of our treatments that we have uh, for Alzheimer's disease um, have not been highly effective. I think the last FDA approved medication for the disease was way back in 2003. And so I think the hope is if we can identify this problem earlier, then we can intervene earlier and maybe have a greater chance uh, of success. Um, and so to do, how do we identify disease early? I think we're gonna be talking a lot about biomarkers today. So some, some of these have already been mentioned. Um, Dr. Kanan mentioned tau makes up these neurofibrillary tangles you see here. Uh, there's a lot of focus often on amyloid plaques that develop in the brain. Of course, these are the two cardinal features of Alzheimer's disease uh, within the brain. So we can uh, assess these biomarkers a variety of ways. We'll talk a lot today about blood tests, but you can also um, obtain them from spinal fluid. Uh, you can see some of the plaques and tangles as well in neuroimaging. So um, since 2012, we've had the ability uh, clinically to use PET scan imaging, for example, to detect amyloid plaques. And even though they're not often technically considered a biomarker, I also wanted to throw in this idea of genetic variants because there are some rare genetic mutations that almost inevitably cause disease. And so those are being used a lot in research studies to identify you know, very high risk populations before they have any symptoms. And I think we've, over time, we try to think about, well, how do these uh, biomarkers relate to one another and how do they unfold over time? And so some of you may have uh, be familiar with this idea of this amyloid cascade hypothesis. And I think the evidence suggests that the first um, uh, sign of neuropathology is often these amyloid plaques that again can develop uh, maybe even decades before any symptoms. And you can see uh, other biomarker potentials here, 
in terms of you know, detecting inflammation in the brain, uh, the tau tangles. We can then later on see, look at brain atrophy through uh, technologies like MRI. And again, this is all before we even see clinically any symptoms of the disease. So there's been a lot of focus on really trying to understand these biomarkers and how they unfold over time. And then again, trying to then ultimately uh, develop therapies that might target some of these processes. So with that as a backdrop, I think today we're really excited to talk about one particular type of biomarker that made a huge splash on the scene. Some of you may know over the summer in July, we had our big International Alzheimer's Association International Conference. And so you can see these ripped from the headlines uh, stories are all focusing on real excitement about a particular blood biomarker that our panelists are gonna speak about today. And you can see the headlines, uh, you know, tout the uh, importance of this and talk a little bit about the potential for how this might be used in the future. Uh, I won't say a lot about that now because I think our panelists are gonna cover that. Um, but just to give you a little bit of background on, on what these studies were about. So this was a particular biomarker that again, detected um, via blood sample that's called PTAL217. And what was exciting about these findings is that uh, First of all, it wasn't just one study. You know, we talk a lot in science about the importance of replication. We don't just uh, say that one study definitively settles a matter. We like to see the same signal across multiple different studies. And so these were you know, different groups uh, across the globe looking at this biomarker in different contexts. And they were all kind of coming up with some of the same answers in that they were finding that this biomarker was both highly sensitive and specific in detecting Alzheimer's cases. And so when we talk about sensitive, we means that if, if uh, it's detecting uh, the disease pathology, if it's there. So there's no what we call false negatives. It's, it's really, if it's there, it's picking it up. And then it's all, but it was also highly specific. So it wasn't having a lot of false positives. So the idea behind there is if it's specific, if it's detecting the, the, uh, the disease pathology, it's not also detecting other um, other markers that might uh, not be Alzheimer's disease. So this, this uh, is really important in a, in a test. I think our, our panelists may elaborate on that theme. Um, and then interestingly, there was a separate study. Uh, I mentioned the genetic mutations earlier. So there was a separate study looking at some of these mutation carriers. And that study suggested that this blood test that was being developed might be able to develop, uh, to detect um, the, the pathology even up to 20 years before any symptom onset. And so, uh, you know, because we're talking about blood, this can be done, of course, a lot more easily and cheaply than these much more uh, elaborate uh, PET scan or, or spinal tap technologies. Um, but of course, uh, in research, we, we always like to see um, replication, not just across different, um, bench studies, but then thinking about beyond that in terms of more diverse real world settings as opposed to some of these highly specialized academic medical centers. So I just wanted to present that as a little bit of background. Um, and then um, again, this kind of returning to our, um, our schematic of how the disease unfolds over time, you can see again, a blood-based biomarker, particularly if it can be used in this preclinical phase, can be very valuable, I think. Um, so that was just a little bit to give you all some background. But let's, um, let's talk a little bit now with our panelists to delve into a little bit more detail. So um, Dr. Kanan, I wanted to start with you. Uh, so I, I mentioned this, this plasma P217 biomarker, but can you tell us exactly how does this really work? Can you tell more, more how, how does it operate uh, so we, at the biological level? Yeah, sure. I think, uh, uh, thanks for the overview. I think that was, that was helpful to get us going. Um, I, you know, I'd actually like to probably start by sort of zooming out a little bit. I think that these assays and biomarker research works because of patient participation. So I wanted to give a plug for patients to participate in clinical research. So those of you out there listening, you know, this is super critical and the MADRC is one of the routes through which you can do this really important uh, component to us moving forward and advancing the field and helping patients ultimately. So um, it starts there. Um, then it's actually a very straightforward process in a lot of ways. I mean, it's based on a normal 
blood draw you would get. Um, I'm sure pretty much the entire audience at some point has probably had a blood draw of some kind. Um, and you basically separate the, the plasma from the blood. And then that's what we store to use for detecting these various forms of proteins, in this case, a phosphorylated form of tau protein. Um, and so it's really a very easy, simple collection. Um, blood is, is, is I guess, um, less invasive than, for example, spinal fluid, um, which requires a, a spinal tap. Um, and so it has a lot of advantages in that way. Um, it's also very amenable to longitudinal collection. Um, so at the Alzheimer's Center at U of M, we're planning to collect blood from patients that are participating annually, which will give us a really nice set of samples to track changes in biomarkers over time. Um, and the, the way the assay works is uh, in sort of an umbrella way, it's, these are immunoassays, which um, basically means in a very simplified form that they're using antibodies to detect these various forms of the target proteins in the, in the blood in this, in this particular case. Um, now, historically, uh, the brain-derived proteins that are of interest for us to study are in very low quantities. And so it was only more recently, like back in the mid 2000s, tens, you know, uh, or 2010s, where the technology advanced to a level at which you could detect levels of tau, for example, or amyloid, um, or other proteins of interest in the blood. Um, and so those were really sophisticated amino assays that are for the science people in the audience, uh, sophisticated adaptations of what's called an ELISA, which is an enzyme linked immunosorbent assay. But um, basically, what you're doing is you're taking in this case the plasma and you're using an antibody to capture the protein of interest. And so it, that this antibody in the case of the assay we use is bound to a bead. It pulls the specific form of tau, in this case, the phospho217 tau out of the plasma. And then you use another antibody to come in and label that protein that was bound by the bead antibody. And that antibody creates a fluorescent signal and the machines that we use can detect that signal down to very low levels. Um, in fact, uh, one protein bound to a bead can be detected in these kind of assays. And so then you, you take that sample and you spin it into this fancy disc and you just measure the fluorescence of the beads that fit into a single well. And so it, it really gives you this, this ultra sensitive level of detection that wasn't available before. And so you just couldn't see the tau, for example, that was in the blood. Um, and that's been really the, the major advance that's happened in the last few years. And there's a few uh, platforms that get us down to this ultra sensitive level. For example, Eli Lilly has a, a technology called Mesoscale um, Discovery, which is um, what they actually used in that paper you were referencing there um, at uh, Michigan State um, and through the Alzheimer's Center. We're going to be using a technology called the Samoa or single molecule um, assay. Uh, which is from Quanterix. And so there, there are different flavors of the same kind of assay, but both are using antibodies to pull out the specific forms of the proteins and measure the level that's, that's present. Yeah. So that, that's really how they work in a sort of simplified nutshell. Yeah. Great, that, that's very helpful. Can you say a little bit more about, this wasn't certainly the first blood-based biomarker to be tried in, in Alzheimer's research. Can you say a little bit more about why you think this was an improvement over prior attempts. Uh, you know, I talked about this high sensitivity and specificity. Why does this particular test, uh, why was it able to achieve that compared to maybe some other blood biomarkers? Yeah, so, so the biomarker field in a, in a relatively short amount of time has, I think, highlighted the way um, clinical research and even basic research is somewhat iterative, right? So. Um, tau and amyloid actually weren't the first blood-based biomarker assay that neurodegeneration. It was actually a protein called neurofilament light, um, which is a structural protein in cells. And when they degenerate, that spills out and eventually finds its way into the blood. And, and so that was the first assay that was developed. Um, but that one is more of a marker of general neurodegeneration. And so it doesn't have that uh, sensitivity and specificity for Alzheimer's disease, you know, so it's just a uh, brain injury can also cause an increase in that marker. Um, following that was, was sort of a, a, a push to move towards the, 
the most likely candidates, amyloid and, and tau. Amyloid came first um, and the assays were okay, you know, um, and so you could detect it, but it wasn't really, didn't really show the level of sensitivity and specificity you would really want. And then after the amyloid tests were developed, the total tau, so not phosphorylated, this just saw all the proteins, all the tau proteins that were present in the blood. Again, the assay worked, but it, it wasn't very um, uh, high in sensitivity and specificity for Alzheimer's disease. And then um, shortly after that, they developed the first phospho tau assay. And this was against a different uh, phospho form of the protein, uh, phosphorylated form of the protein at uh, 181. So these are, maybe I should clarify for the audience, just for people that don't know, what we're talking about is the amino acids in the protein tau, and they're modified by having a phosphate group added to a phosphorylation at a certain site. And so that's what these are targeting. And the reason that's important is because we've known for many, many decades now that tau is abnormally phosphorylated in Alzheimer's disease and other diseases. And so it's really taking advantage of this um, uh, phenomenon that occurs in the human disease and detecting specifically those types of tau protein in the blood. And 181, the first phospho tau an, uh, assay was, was actually all the rage. I mean, it, it, it was looking very, very promising. It showed better sensitivity and specificity. Um, it correlated with a lot of other uh, markers like PET and um, other CSF markers, which are kind of the gold standard for biofluid biomarkers is the spinal fluid. Um, but we've talked about why, why that's not the most ideal uh, uh, biofluid to, to go after. Um, and so, so people were very excited about that. And then, and then shortly after the 217 assay data came out and it was even better. So, you know, we're just, it's sort of iteratively moving in the right direction, fortunately. And uh, it's, it's really exciting for the field. And I, I think it's that targeting a specific type of tau that clearly has some link to disease that's really exciting and, and what's pushed it towards a higher sensitivity and specificity. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're talking about tau because I think there's been so much excitement in that area of Alzheimer's research not just through blood-based biomarkers, but a lot of tau imaging techniques. Yep. And even though amyloid and tau are both kind of the cardinal features of, of Alzheimer's, it seems like the tau presence of tau is more tightly correlated with people's cognition than presence of, of amyloid. But of course, they both need to be present in order to have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. So even though this biomarker is called P-tau-217, does it pick up amyloid in, in any way or? Sort of indirectly, that's actually, I think, one of the um, maybe most powerful or more, most interesting uh, sets of results they found with this specific marker is that it really seems to be tied to the presence of amyloid. And that's what helps drive the differential um, detection of Alzheimer's disease versus other neurodegenerative diseases that don't necessarily involve amyloid pathology. And so this, this was one of the key findings, I think, in the paper that really um, is what's helping to drive the specificity for this, for this uh, assay. I'm just going to add into what Nick is saying there. I think that's really critical. Remember that tau accumulates in a lot of conditions, progressive supranuclear palsy, cortical basal degeneration, chronic traumatic encephalopathy or pro-football dementia, as some people think of it. Tau accumulates in those conditions, but the tau that accumulates in Alzheimer's includes this phosphorylation at 217. That's very specific. And so that, that not only is important for a potential precise peripheral blood biomarker diagnosis, but it also is mechanistically quite interesting. So how we know there's a link between amyloid deposition and tau deposition, but that 217 link is telling us that that phosphorylation event, it may be the epiphenomenon, but it's definitely telling us a little bit about that A-beta connection. Great. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad you, you weighed in, Dr. Paulson, because I was going to transition to you next. And thanks, Dr. Kanan. As uh, I was an English major as an undergrad, so I really appreciate your being able to explain in clear terms some of this advanced science. Um, sure. But Dr. Paulson, I know you can speak on the basic science side as well, but let's maybe with your clinical hat on, 
Can you talk about why do you think there was such excitement about the potential for clinical translation from these findings? Well, let me tell you from the perspective of a neurologist, literally yesterday, I gave the results to a patient of his cerebrospinal fluid analysis. And we can analyze that, that CSF for A beta and tau and phospho tau. And based on the amount of A beta and the amount of tau and the amount of phospho tau, we can say there's a high probability or a very low probability or an indeterminate probability that the cause of your cognitive difficulties is Alzheimer's. And in his case, I was able to say because of where it plotted on that, that, that graph, that yes, your dementia looks like it's an Alzheimer's driven dementia. He wanted to know that, his wife wanted to know that, they wanted the puzzle to be solved. So we did that, but to get that information, he had to come back for a second visit with a, you know, a lumbar puncture with a special person doing that, which has its own risks to it. It's a, it was an expensive thing to do. And most people are not interested in having a needle stuck in their back. Almost everyone's willing to have a needle stuck in their arm to have a blood drawn because they've had it done before. They know that. But a needle in the back, taking spinal fluid out, is a scary thought for many people. So if we could transition from a CSF-based precise diagnosis, as I talked about with this particular patient, to a blood-based diagnosis, that would be fantastic. So that's where I think this is a game changer. The sensitivity of these new techniques and the identification of phospho tau 217 is a good marker for um, Alzheimer's driven tauopathy, if you will, um, means that we could use this pretty quickly in practice. Now, not yet. The study here was a, this was a research, research grade uh, assay. Uh, it needs to be tested in a real world situation, as you said, not from a selected population. These were all selected populations to see how well it works in a community setting. Um, here's an interesting point. Um, I mentioned that I'm interested in protein misfolding broadly. And one of the things that the PFD initiative that I co-direct is interested in is the shared pathways of abnormal protein deposition. And the no longer secret in the field of dementia is that if you look at brains of people who've died from dementia, perhaps the most common thing we find is not one thing, not just Alzheimer's or not just Lewy body dementia or not just frontotemporal dementia with TDB43 accumulation. It is more than one thing. And in fact, uh, we heard in the ADC meetings a couple of weeks ago that when you looked at a community-based uh, pathology setting, 19% of the brains that were evaluated had four different proteins accumulating in the brain, okay? Amyloid, tau, TDP43, and synuclein from Lewy body. So we know that a lot of dementia is mixed and heterogeneous. This kind of a test will be very important to say that an Alzheimer's type pathology is contributing in an individual, okay? If it's absent, it suggests something else is going on. It doesn't mean you're out of the woods. It means something else is going on. But if it's present, it means that the, an amyloid-based tauopathy is part of what's going on. So I think that's important. It'll be faster, cheaper. Patients are willing, will be willing to do it. The ability to have a precision diagnosis, which is what we all want to be able to do to make sure that the people get the right therapies for the disease they have, will all be facilitated by this kind of a test. Great, thank you. Can I yeah, just I... share my screen for one second? Um, sure. Can I do that, Danielle? Let me see if I can share my screen, okay. Um, okay, share my screen. So I just wanted, because Nick mentioned this NFL, um, can you see my screen? Yep. So this is actually from that paper that we're talking about. And this is from figure two, and this is an area under the curve graph and this 2117 phospho tau is showing an incredibly good sensitivity specificity curve. This is an excellent curve. He mentioned neurofilament light. It's a measure non specifically of basically a process going on in the brain. Pretty crappy in terms of area under the curve. This is the NFL right here. And this 181, which he mentioned, which was all the rage initially, is, is not bad. It's here in this orange curve, but not nearly as good as the. 2117. So that's just one piece of data that uh, I want to stop sharing my screen just to show you that something like neurofilament light is an important discovery, It's but it's not specific. It won't allow the precision diagnosis that something like 2117 will allow. Now, will we have a similar type of precise 
assay for progressive supranuclear palsy, a different type of tauopathy, or for cortical basal degeneration, or maybe even for chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or for synucleinopathies. That will be, I'm sure we will, it'll take some time, but for these new high sensitivity um, assay capacities, I think we'll be able to develop those things. And that's one of the things I'm hoping that the biomarker core in the center will be able to do, because we're studying um, people over time. And this raises another very important point. I, I think uh, uh, it's a great paper. I thought this was an excellent paper. And there's several other good papers out there showing that phospho uh, tau 2117 is a good marker, for example, the Nature Medicine paper, also in 2020 from Bateman's group, Bartholemy et al. is a really nice study showing, you can see this very early in genetic cohorts, you can see this tau signature accumulating in the CSF. But one thing that is a limitation of the current study is that it's a fairly non-diverse population they've looked at. And we don't know enough about the biomarkers and the contributors to dementia in the Hispanic community and in the Black community. And that's one of the things that our center is really interested in trying to make a difference on. Great. Well, thanks, Dr. Paulson. To kind of follow up, you were talking about this idea of uh, this kind of test, you know, helping differentiate what type of dementia are we talking about? And, you know, maybe sometimes it is mixed dementia, but sometimes maybe there's really one dementia diagnosis to be arrived at. Um, can you say a little bit more about, do you see this as potentially helping a, a wider range of physicians make an Alzheimer's diagnosis? Um, uh, or, or are you concerned about the idea of more generalists kind of using a test like this and you feel like it should be this, the neurology specialist who's the best equipped? To kind I, of I am a neurologist and I <laughs> like to think that we bring value to diagnosis, but um, this is the type of test that I think could be a game changer in terms of its being used more broadly by general practitioners. We know that most people who have cognitive impairment beyond the age of 60 are not seeing neurologists, they're seeing interns, they're seeing family practitioners, they're seeing geriatricians. Um, and this kind of a test, I think is sensitive and specific enough that it could, and, and I think doable enough from a practical standpoint, that it could be done, the result could come back and the result itself could be fairly definitive in saying what it means. Um, we know, for example, that amyloid accumulation does not mean you will definitely get Alzheimer's disease, right? There are people who have amyloid accumulation who do not have the tauopathy occurring as well. The minority, but it does happen. So amyloid by itself is, is and this is why, for example, APOE4 allele testing, and you talked about genetic testing, itself is a little bit more difficult for a general physician to interpret for a patient because they're not sure exactly what it's going to mean. But I think this is the kind of thing where if someone had mild cognitive impairment or had subjective memory complaints and had a blood test that so showed there was a clearly highly elevated PT17 tau, I think it would be, and, and probably an MRI in that scenario also would show some shrinkage of parts of the brain, just the traditional MRI. I think a non-neurologist, non-specialist could help that patient know this is precisely what we're dealing with. And the reason I think that that's worth doing is that we see an awful lot of people who are given the diagnosis of Alzheimer's who do not have Alzheimer's disease. They show up and they've got some cognitive complaints. They may have pseudo dementia from depression. They may have uh, you know, metabolic disorders that have not been uh, looked into adequately. And so this kind of a test, if it were able to identify some mimics that this is not Alzheimer's, this is something else, might then encourage those general doctors to send the individuals to a specialist. That's a long-winded answer to the question, but no, I hope very, it was helpful. No, very helpful. And, and while we're on this idea of kind of the future model of care, it, it seems like this kind of blood test might be the first step, but what could we still gain in terms of additional neuroimaging beyond just a blood biomarker that, that even as great as this test is, is not going to Tell us why would we still need this won't put imaging people out of business, will it? In terms of right, so so someone could have the early signs of an Alzheimer's process that had a positive PT17 tau test, but the cognitive issues that they're experiencing are because they've got a frontal meningioma that's blocking their frontal lobe. So you need to do imaging. I personally think if someone has cognitive concerns, 
doing an image of the brain makes a lot of sense. And the other reason why it makes sense to do the imaging is again, because I believe that there will be a lot of mixed pathology going on here. And so for example, vascular pathology is a very big driver of a lot of cognitive impairment. And we can get a good sense of vascular pathology in the brain from a traditional MRI of the brain. So I, I don't think that radiologists are gonna go out of business. Uh, I think this will allow us to identify people for clinical trials who look at anti-tau and anti-amyloid therapies for a specific Alzheimer's um, you know, clinical trial. We know that a lot of the failures in, in Alzheimer's clinical trials, there's a lots of reasons for the failures, but one of them is, is that the recruitment of individuals into those trials had too much heterogeneity, too much that wasn't truly Alzheimer's or was mixed pathology, or in fact, not Alzheimer's at all. So this kind of a test could help us drill down and make sure we have a very precise population that are studied for a clinical trial. Great. I think uh, I'll just add to what, what Dr. Paulson said there, um, the imaging also gives you neuroanatomical specificity. So you can look at which brain regions are affected, which you can't in these blood-based biomarker assays. I mean, it's just, we, we don't really know exactly where in the brain the PT17 tau is coming from. But with neuroimaging, you can look for amyloid and tau pathologies regionally through the brain to help, you know, again, improve the diagnostic um, uh, well, yeah, the, the, the fantasy clinic for me would be one where I would have a, a blood-based biomarker that gave me a precise diagnosis and I followed up with specific pet ligand imaging in individuals. But from a clinical real-world scenario, I think it's going to be difficult to find a way to get in the clinical setting, not research setting, the clinical setting, to get tau imaging or amyloid imaging or down the road, TDP43 imaging or synuclein imaging on individuals. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be curious to see how much that actually changes clinical practice. I think uh, traditional imaging plus biomarkers that are based on peripheral or even CSF could drive things much better than, than PET ligand imaging, which will always remain expensive. And I don't want to be a damper on that because the, the fantasy clinic would have all those things. Yeah. Well, being in public health, I appreciate appreciate that point. You know, we talk about uh, the need for how do we address health disparities? How do we increase access to quality care? And there's, as you point out, there's so many challenges with a high tech, high specialist approach to, to, to see the huge numbers of people who are going to be developing different forms of dementia in the coming yeah. decades. I do want to encourage people to ask questions from our audience. I'm sure they do have questions, but while they're thinking of them and putting them in the chat space, um, I did want to say one thing, which is, for example, there is one company right now that is seeking approval for an anti-amyloid therapy, an antibody-based anti-amyloid therapy. We know that that would only be useful if it's approved, will only be useful in people who actually have amyloid deposition occurring. So there needs to be a way to identify those individuals. How do you do that? You can do it with amyloid PET imaging, but let's imagine that a P T17 tau assay were available, it would be able to tell us that indeed that person might be a good candidate for that drug. These will be expensive drugs. They'll be drugs that require regular infusions. So there'll be a lot of burden on the individuals. So we want to make sure that we have identified the right people to do that on. Great. And a, another added benefit there is that that tight link we mentioned earlier between PT217 tau and amyloid pathology is a way for you to sort of monitor amyloid pathology indirectly by looking at PT217 because it turns out that there are peripheral sources that can contribute to the amyloid um, signal you get in the blood. And so in, in some ways there's an extra uh, added uh, benefit there with looking at PT217 tau sort of as a surrogate for amyloid pathology in the brain. So it's a, it was a really key key finding, I think, in that paper, like we yeah. said. Or, so. I think that uh, Nick, and are we, now, as we prepare to do peripheral biomarker assessment uh, in our research participants, uh, in whom 40% are Black Americans, do you think that P217 tau is one that you would, you will incorporate into your assays? Yeah, absolutely. I know um, the, the company that makes the kit uh, for the system we use, the Samoa system, uh, it, that's in the works. And as soon as uh, it comes out, we're already on the pre-order list. So <laughs> yeah. All right, good. Right. good. 
Yeah. And again, I just have to emphasize, I don't think we know enough about the biomarkers in diverse populations. We know a lot in Caucasians, but we don't know much beyond that. So this is something I think we can make a contribution to the field. Absolutely. Are there questions? Yeah, so now maybe now we can um, open up to the broader group for questions. I think this is some great background. And wh while people are either typing um, in the chat, uh, maybe I could, while we kind of take stock of these questions, ask our two panelists to say a little bit more. You kind of alluded to what's going on at, at uh, here in the state of Michigan, but maybe elaborate a little bit more on, um, you know, with the kind of research uh, beyond this PTAUS 217 that's been mentioned uh, is going on here. So our ADRC has as its central theme, the non-amyloid contributions to brain dysfunction and dementia. We recognize that amyloids are important for Alzheimer's, but there's so many other proteins and other factors that are involved in Alzheimer's. Plus there's so many other proteins and factors involved in non-Alzheimer's dementia. So that's really our broad, broadly constructed theme. So there are many people at this university here at Michigan who work on mechanisms of frontotemporal dementia. Our clinical core leader, Ben Hampstead, does a lot of interesting work on um, brain stimulation as a way to really um, uh, identify networks that are involved and to enhance the, those network of capacity to deal with cognitive impairment. Um, we obviously have uh, a lot of work going on on tau uh, in, in Grand Rapids at Michigan State with Nick, Nick's group, um, also looking at tauopathies more broadly, not simply in Alzheimer's disease. Um, your own work, Scott, of course, is in looking at uh, risk disclosure, risk identification, risk disclosure. We think this is really important for our center to um, spend more time helping to disclose to research participants and the broader community what we find so they understand what's going on. I think that's a start of the many different things we do. And, and uh, that's all in the context of it being a statewide center that you know, is not linking just three universities, but hitting the entire state. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of work that we do in the Detroit uh, uh, metropolitan area, including a large emphasis on Black Americans. Uh, and we are building out into the Grand Rapids space. And in this strange COVID time where we've in, in started doing a lot of remote assessments, we're actually seeing people higher up in the state in the lower peninsula and even in the upper peninsula through remote testing. So that's a long answer to your question, Scott. We have no, a lot of questions think, in the box now, it looks like. Yeah, I think it's actually, and they're coming in both through the chat and the Q&A, so we'll try to handle both. But I guess as a segue term, what you just talked about, uh, there was one question that's asked if this biomarker can identify people with Alzheimer's 20 years prior to symptoms, but there's no available treatment, doesn't that cause ethical issues with returning these results to non-symptomatic people? And so uh, I, can, I can start with that, but then I'm uh, interested in your guys' thoughts as well. Were you about to say something? No, no, that is your domain. You go for it. Yeah, so um, see, this is something we've done uh, in a variety of ways with other biomarkers. So we have a current study right now called Reveal Scan, where we're disclosing amyloid status to people who are uh, older adults who have a family history of the disease and who are interested in learning, uh, do they have you know, significant amyloid deposition in the brain? And so in part because we're, we're recognizing this is potentially sensitive information and could actually have some harms in terms of psychological distress or maybe even broader social stigma. Um, so we're, we're uh, underway with that study, but I think the body of work, both for disclosure of amyloid and also our own earlier work on disclosure of genetic results, specifically APOE, uh, it's been heartening in some respects in that I think a lot of people feared that uh, people would respond with a lot of psychological distress if they got bad news. But we found that if you provide the appropriate education and counseling and delivering the information, then uh, it's pretty rare actually that people have you know, a dramatic increase in their psychological distress uh, in the aftermath of, of learning these types of results. So I think, uh, and there's a whole host of, you know, there's also these broader issues around when we are talking about genetic results, I do think we need to be mindful of the potential for genetic discrimination. Uh, fortunately, we have some federal laws in place that actually prevent health insurers and employers from using genetic information to discriminate, but we don't have those same levels of protections in long-term care, for example. And so some have suggested, do we need to 
beef up those policies uh, in order to kind of ward off. I don't think this discrimination is occurring at, in, in a widespread way, but you could imagine uh, it being a risk in, in the future. So great question about um, you know, ethical issues and disclosure, particularly when we don't have right now the effective prevention and, and treatment options. And I, I'll just add that I think that it's very important for us as healthcare providers to know what patients want to know. And I think, for example, if you talk, you talk about someone who is at risk for a genetic disease like Huntington's disease or the spinal cerebral ataxia, some of those individuals really want to know whether they have the they carry the gene, disease gene or not, and many do not want to know. And that's very important that it be driven by the interest of the individual. For those who want to know, that bit of information somehow allows them to uh, plan their lives in ways. Um, and those who don't want to know feel that somehow the information could be detrimental to their planning their lives. And so it's, a, it's a very much an individual decision. Uh, let me take the first question I see here from Victor Dorita. It's uh, talking about the importance of eye movements in making an Alzheimer's or other dementia diagnosis. And finishes by saying, I've recently started reading about ocular motility changes in AD and have noted changes in anti saccadal accuracy, pro saccad velocity, et cetera. Uh, I'll start off by saying that um, when I see someone with AD, uh, the most common presentation, but not always, is profound memory loss with a pretty much normal neurologic examination. And from a non-ophthalmologist, non-neuro-ophthalmologist perspective, the eye movement seemed to be normal. Uh, but we do always look at it. And, and I, I would say I'm really attuned to looking for eye movements because I trained in movement disorders. That was my official clinical training was movement disorders. And so I have appreciated the fact that of course, progressive supranuclear palsy, the name of that condition really is saying, I can't, that person cannot move their eyes voluntarily. So we're always looking to see if there are changes in um, volitional eye movements. Uh, it, could it be that this person who has what looks like frontotemporal dementia, do they have progressive supranuclear palsy? And that is a very important finding for us. And I will say that what I've learned now that I focus more on cognitive presentations than movement disorders, is that there's a subset of PSP where people have profound frontal lobe involvement, but the eye movements remain normal for a couple of years before they have any movement disorder, or any eye movement issues. This is something we need to look at more. I think people are looking at retinal pathology. They're looking at uh, uh, cataract pathology in AD. I'm not aware of much of the uh, ocular motility pathology in, in AD. So yeah, a whole host of questions and, and our apologies up front if we're not able to work our way through all of these given the limitations of time. But uh, one interesting question, um, one after that was uh, from Dr. Fleck asking, what, imagining the cost of a PTAU 217 test and what would motivate insurers to cover that cost? Do either of you have any speculation here? From an, from an assay perspective, it's, it's not uh, very expensive. I mean, per sample, it uh, can range on the different kit. Um, somewhere between 40 and maybe 60 or $70 a sample. But, um, you know, that doesn't account for uh, physician times, phlebotomist time, you know, um, processing time, lab tech time, and all that, those other costs, which tend to be the more expensive component of, of various tests. Uh, as far as insurance covering it, maybe I'll pass that over to you more clinically. I, I would say the cost will be hundreds of dollars versus thousands of dollars for a PET's ligand imaging. Um, and that's, that's a big distinguisher there. In terms of insurers covering it, um, what I would say there is uh, the genetic studies that we've done over the years, uh, give me an answer to that question, which is if you can do a test that definitively establishes what the underlying pathology is and prevents another $10,000 of migratory testing, insurance companies are okay with that because it actually reduced their costs ultimately. We get people who have serial MRIs for no good reason uh, with a genetic form of ataxia, uh, which has not led to an answer to the question, whereas a $200 test or even less than that can give a specific genetic answer. And, and for a while, insurance companies would not allow us to do genetic testing, but we were able to make the argument, you know what, you're saving money. If we can have a precise diagnosis, it helps that patient. It gives them, a dis it gives them closure on this mystery disease and it'll prevent us from doing 
a boatload of tests that are very expensive. Well, I think that's how insurers will want to cover the cost. Moreover, if insurers are paying for a medication that's expensive for a specific disease, they're going to want this kind of test to confirm that that's what they have. Yeah, so building on that, uh, Dr. Paulson, one question asks about, you know, this idea of the way we treat different forms of dementia, uh, and one example is Alzheimer's versus Lewy body, uh, might be substantially different. Can you give an example of some of the drawbacks if all we know is that it's a dementia of some type? Um, I think helping to distinguish Alzheimer's from Lewy body is very important. I, I find that to be an important distinction for a couple reasons. One is, I think everyone who we think has clinically probable Lewy body dementia deserves a trial of a cholinesterase inhibitor. Why? Because that is the disease, anecdotally, and everyone agrees with this, where you see robust response in a subset of individuals. It's not Alzheimer's, it's Lewy body dementia where you see that robust response. So I think everyone with Lewy body really warrants a trial of a cholinesterase inhibitor. And in the case of Alzheimer's, if I think it's really Alzheimer's, I'll say to the patients, you know, these, these are symptomatic medications. They may be modestly helpful. Uh, they're not changing the course of disease. Uh, you know, you should consider trying it if you want to give it a shot, but I don't think they have to have that trial. Um, so that's an important difference. The other thing is because of Lewy body dementia's association with Parkinsonism, um, uh, antipsychotics or any medications that are dopamine blocking drug agents can be really hazardous in that condition. So it's important to make that distinction. And right now we make that distinction mostly on clinical grounds. And, and, and perhaps a, a test like this will help us to have a set of biomarkers that, that make that even a more precise diagnosis. Well, there's a couple questions, one in the Q&A, one in the chat that relate to this uh, one person wanting to know, how do I find out more? It sounds really appealing the way we're talking about it, you know, given their family history. I, I, I can just say up front, though, that again, just to reiterate, this is only being done right now in the context of research. It is not clinically available, I think, for some of the reasons we've talked about. Um, but then uh, the, another question re relevant to that is, trying to speculate again, how long do we think before this does become translated into clinical practice? Uh, I think um, I would be surprised if it's more than two years. Really? Well, I think that I would assume that right now they're doing the real world assessment. Uh, I would be shocked if a company doesn't feel there's a chance to make a lot of money here. So I, from a test standpoint, I, I, I I think it's going to be fairly quick. I don't know, Nick, you, you, you don't know assay development and, and it may be that actually going from the research grade to the clinical grade is a big, big deal. And it's a five-year process. I, I think, I think it can be a big deal. I mean, there's a, there's a lot to going into standardizing things, automating things, um, and, and validating its robustness across different populations, different labs, different parts of the world and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, I, I, th I think things are moving very rapidly. So, you know, I'm, I, I'd be optimistic in joining in two, two, two to five years, you know, that'd be awesome. Um, but it really depends, you know, um, on how, how it goes. But I agree with you. There's undoubtedly company interest in this, which always helps it advance, you know, so it's hard to, it's hard to know for sure. We're, we're not driving this, so we're all we're completely speaking out of the top of our heads, and we don't really know what we're talking about here, to be very honest. We're being recorded, too, so we can go back, you know, two years from now. Uh, where, where, whereas I think it's always hazardous to say we think that the disease-modifying therapy is going to avail in less than five years when we're talking about a blood-based uh, biomarker test for which I see really robust uh, data in several now papers. I would be shocked if it isn't within five years, um, unless they run into major issues there. Someone asked, what was the drug? The, what I mentioned is cholinesterase inhibitors, drugs such as denepazil, ribostigmine, brand names, Aricept, uh, Exelon. These type of drugs are uh, uh, approved for use in people who have an amyloid or Alzheimer's type of uh, dementia. Uh, and, uh, but we know anecdotally that they work quite well in a subset of Lewy body dementia. Not everyone with Lewy body dementia does well, but 
that's a, that's a medication that I feel is important to give a trial to in Lewy body dementia. While we're on this topic of um, drug therapies, and unfortunately, I think this is going to have to be our last question given time. And again, I we apologize to some great questions out there that we just don't have time to march through all of them. But this last question talks about Alzheimer's being a heterogeneous disease and the potential need to target multiple pathways to improve outcomes. So th this person is wondering, do we think we need to ultimately have some kind of combination therapy? And is there any clinical trial out there that's looking at combination therapies, not just one agent to treat Alzheimer's? A really good question. And of course, uh, the anti-amyloid trials have been at best incrementally positive or, and, and most often negative. Uh, so we know that a purely anti-amyloid uh, therapeutic approach is probably not going to be very effective in this disease. And anti-tau approaches or anti-immunological inflammatory approaches with our knowledge now of the importance of microglia and astrocytes in disease, uh, I think we may end up with a time where we have multi-therapy approaches as we do for successfully for diseases such as AIDS. Uh, HIV treatment has become so successful because it wasn't a single treatment, but it was multiple treatments. And the same is true for cancer, and I think this may well be the case for Alzheimer's as well. As, as of for a specific trial that now is testing two therapies, I'm not aware of one right now. Great. Well, I think, unfortunately, we're almost at the top of the hour, so uh, I'm going to close out and, again, thank uh, Dr. Kanan and Dr. Paulson for their insights today. Appreciate your, your contributions. And um, if I'm able to share my slides again, I will turn it back to uh, Danielle to wrap up. All right. Thank you. Thanks again, gentlemen. That was wonderful. And thank you everyone for submitting those great questions as well. Um, here's some information for our next um, speaker series that'll be coming up in November. There is the link to register if you're interested in that and you'll also um, get more info. If can I say something real quickly? Sure. Uh, Sammy Barmada is an outstanding clinician scientist who does tremendous work on some of these proteins that cause non-Alzheimer's. I highly recommend that talk. It'll be a really fascinating talk. All right. And if you can go to the next slide, Scott. All right. And so just some ways to stay in contact and find out what the center is up to. You're more than welcome to subscribe to our e-newsletter. And then there is the handles for our social media contact. And again, just a reminder to please fill out the evaluation. Again, your feedback is very important and um, very, you know, greatly appreciated. So thanks again, everyone, and enjoy your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody.